teacher dr prashant agrawal and uh, without any delay i request dr agrawal to start thank you good evening everybody uh, at the outset let me thank dr siddharth and dr agnivesh for giving me this opportunity to share my views about a fracture healing as all of us are orthopedic surgeons and we know fracture is very important part of our life so we need to understand how fracture heals and what are the various reasons for failure of <coughs> healing and other things which can be uh, studied and can be we can improvise the process of fracture healing or we can give a better result to our patients now <coughs> at the outset let's have some objectives where we we are going to study the basic anatomy physiology of bone and we understand how bone develops and that will help us in knowing how fracture heals during the course of a healing also we will try to understand why so many other, so so many fractures they do not heal what are the various reasons for non healing of a fracture and what are the complications associated with the fractures this is a basic uh, definition of a fracture it is a break in a continuity of a calcified structure of a bone it could be because of extrinsic or intrinsic mechanical force like you see fracture of a patella because of sudden contracture of a cordyceps that could be because of the <coughs> sudden pull of a muscle on the bone or same is in the olecranon or there may be a direct impact or uh, injury to the uh, long bones leading to fracture healing as we know <coughs> it's a complex process and which involves lot of physiological factors i usually compare healing of a bone with a normal pregnancy or a delivery where most of the things are physiological <coughs> and we need to understand physiology for understanding process of healing and one good part of fracture healing is it's a regeneration and it's not a repair where in repair like we see in the skin you get a scar tissue it's not a normal bone tissue a uh, normal tissue so whenever there is a healing of a wound the scar tissue is formed and whereas in case of bone we get a total regeneration of a bone so it's a regeneration rather than the <coughs> repair now basically when we see bone there long bones and flat bones the characteristic of long bones weight bearing upper limb lower limb bones and flat bones like clavicle scapula pelvis basically the development wise this flat bones they develop from different source like intramembranous ossification and the long bones they develop from the endochondral ossification which we are going to see basic structure of a bone is a cortical and cancellous cortical is a compact bone almost 80% of skeleton is cortical high compressive strength bending and rotational strength and slow turnover the remodeling process is very slow in case of a cortical bone as compared to cancellous bone which is a spongy and almost contribute 20% of skeleton and less dense <laughs> and strong and there is a high turnover rate in the cancellous bone now development wise there are two types lamellar bone where orderly arranged tissue collagen fibers in the normal way with the aversion system in place whereas in open bone or immature bone you have a non lamellar randomly arranged oriented collagen fibers and you see <coughs> some osteomucin is being laid down and osteoblast cells are seen in between the tissue this is usually seen in case of a uh, in endochondral ossification or endo uh, usually seen when in during the long growth at the epiphyseal end or it can also be seen in the healing phase or in some tumors also in the intramembranous or open bone can be seen directly in the uh, healing of a bone or also in the flat bone development or when mesenchymal cells they differentiate into osteoblast we get a intramembranous way of formation of bone or we see a open bone now basic biology of a 
bone, as we know, it's an osteoblast or osteoclast or osteocytes. If you see basic cell of a bone, osteoblast, these are osteoprogenitor cells and usually they are produced from the deep layer of periosteum, that is a cambium layer, they, or any mesenchymal cells, they have a potential to get converted into osteoblast. And this is a key cell in a process of healing or in a bone. <coughs> Both whether it is a O1 bone like we have seen or a lamellar bone, both of these are made up of this osteo made from the osteoblast. And these osteoblasts, what they do, they manufacture collagen fibers, and that is called osteomucin. This collagen fibers and osteomucin, this they form an osteoid, which we are going to see in the subsequent course. And in addition, these osteoblast cells they secrete alkaline phosphatase. This alkaline phosphatase plays important role in calcification of a own bone, which we are going to see during the ossification time. Osteoclasts, these are produced from the multinucleate, these are multinucleated cells produced from the mesenchymal cells and they have a tendency for, they are being used for resorption of a bone. So they have a mucopolysaccharide and acid phosphatase. This acid phosphatase is responsible for a dissolving the bone matrix or dissolving the minerals in the bone and <coughs> doing the osteolysis. So like these osteoclast cells we see in the osteoclastic tumors like a giant cell tumor where there is a lot of osteoclast cells are being present in the tumor and these cells are responsible for the lysis of a bone. Similar osteoclast we can see in the metastasis or a malignant tumors where osteoclastic activity is more and these may they, they will have a <coughs> osteoclysis in the bone. They usually lie in the house shape lacunae and the osteocytes, this is the important cell of a bone and it is observed in the all living bones and these are formed from the osteoblast. Once osteoblast is trapped into minerals, it gets converted into osteocyte. Like we already know, periosteum is a thick layer of a tissue, connective tissue, which covers the bone. And this has a two layers, <coughs> outer layer and inner layer. Outer is a fibrous and inner is a cellular layers. And these layers are, has a, these cells, they have a potential to get converted into osteoblast or fibroblast or a chondroblast. And these are multipotential cells. And these based on the local environment and stimulus, they get converted and they help in the process of healing. Now, <coughs> In children, this periosteum is very thick and it has a lot of cambium layer structure, uh, tissue cells. So these cells are responsible for forming osteoblast and they help you in getting the or healing the bone faster in case of uh, children. Now we have already seen the endochondral ossification and intramembranous ossification. So we go into the depth, endochondral ossification, bone formation, usually Cartilage is formed in between and this cartilage is being replaced with the bone. And the osteoprogenitor cells, they grow inside the cartilage body or dead cartilage cells, which we are going to see again. And this is how the bone is formed in endochondral ossification. Whereas in intramembranous ossification, bone formation occurs without cartilage model. Bone differentiate directly from osteoblasts and they lay down the osteomucin or a connective tissue and mineralization happens and a bone formation occurs there. Now, <laughs> this is an example of endochondral bone formation in a facial growth plate where you have a reserve zone, proliferative zone, hypertrophy zone and ossification zone. So if there is a defect in any one of them, then they can produce a specific disease. Like <laughs> if there is a defect in the proliferative phase, these patients will have a normal development of a intramembranous bone like axial skeleton will develop normally whereas long bones will not develop completely. So these patients will have a short extremities because there is a problem with the proliferative zone in the epifacial region. So these patients will have a normal skull bone, clavicle, vertebral bodies, everything will be normal as compared to the extremities which will be short and these will have a typical presentation of achondroplasia. In, similarly in mucopolysaccharidosis there is a problem with the hypotropic zone and patients will have a sim <coughs> presentation according to that. For us, most important is rickets and osteomalacia where there is a problem with the ossification zone. So the 
osteoid is formed normally but it is not osseified it is not ossified or it's not calcified so there is a soft osteo uh, soft so the connective tissue forms is the soft and it's not mineralized so defective mineralization or ossification leading to <coughs> rickets in scurvy there is osseomucin is not secreted because there is a connective tissue problem connective tissue is not synthesized completely so but ossification is normal so these patients will have a that type of deformity now fracture again it's a broken bone with any bone can broke break and can lead to disruption or fracture may most important is it can occur in any bone and it can occur in any part of bone but a healing process and mechanism will more or less will be the same same <coughs> results from the fracture patient will have loss of motion and will have a <coughs> difficulty to maintain the structural support now <coughs> pathology of bone forming like we have seen intramembranous bones like skull bones facial bones clavicle they directly develop from the intramembranous ossification now the mesenchymal cells they get converted they can be from endosteum or periosteum as we seen these cells get converted into chondroblast or osteoblast and or <coughs> these chondroblast once they form they can ultimately gets converted into or gets occupied by osteoblast and you get a bone formation there but whenever there is a fracture when their bone healing process starts usually there is a lot of like you see a diagram where lot of tissues are multi, uh, tissues are there the processes of healing is going on but you can have a multiple if you do a biopsy and if you study histopathologically you will have a multiple events occurring at the same time somewhere you have a chondro uh, endochondral ossification going on sometime somewhere you have a intramembranous type of ossification going on and bone healing process is on briefly if you understand want to understand healing is of two types primary type or a secondary type primary healing where the bone is directly formed without forming a callus when fracture is fixed anatomically with a good compression at fracture site and without any mobility and mobility or when gap is less than 2 mm 2% strain at the fracture site there is no callus formation and bone will heal by a method of intracondral ossification or bone will heal with the help of <coughs> bone will heal with the help of but directly in um, osteoblast will migrate directly and bone will heal that we'll see again whereas this is the example of a primary healing where you have a compression at the fracture site and you are using a lax screw or you are using a neutralization plate or a compression plate where you are compressing the fracture site and you are immobilizing it completely without keeping any gap at the fracture site then bone have no option rather than heal by a primary intention whereas in secondary or indirect healing you have non rigid fixation fixation is not that rigid or fixation is elastic like you see in a functional cast brace or a plaster or intramedullary nail external fixation or breech plate the callus formation is most endochondral ossification occurs there and bone heals with the help of this type of this thing now if you see <coughs> you understand perin theory when there is a lot of mobility at the fracture site the osteoprogenitor cells depending on mobility or we can call it the instability you can have a type of cell production like if less than 2% direct bone formation can occur if <coughs> 2 to 10% mobility then you can have a callus formation there a secondary healing if fracture is abnormal mobility is there to 10 to 100% then you have a chances of getting a fibrous union at the fracture site if mobility is more than 100% then you can have a non union there similarly electric currents and potentials are also present at the fracture site and these will also help you in getting the healing process induced now we go into the basics like stages of fracture healing simple fracture heal with the help of hematoma formation then you have a lot of granulation or inflammation at the fracture site granulation or inflammation at the fracture site this inflammation will lead to uh, synthesis of lot of uh, in, in inflammatory mediators are secreted 
and these inflammatory mediators they will help you in inducing the process of healing which will induce the granulation tissue formation which will induce the cellular proliferation and you have a formation of a soft callus right and callus will bridge from one end to another end this callus later on gets converted into a <coughs> calcified calcified or hard callus and later this hard callus is get in ossified to form a new bone and which later can gets uh depending on the strain and uh, old flaw depending on the strain at the fracture site get converted into uh they, they they will be remodeling occurring at the fracture site like when there is a fracture we see hematoma a lot of cells being coll collected at the fracture site the broken bones also secrete lot of inflammatory mediators these mediators will induce the mesenchymal cells to form either osteoblast or osteoclast osteoclast or a chondroblast and based on that you have a mixed picture here like we have seen in the fracture hematoma you and in the granulation tissue you have o1 bone formation you have a endochondral bone formation and this whole thing gets converted into a hard mass or it gets ossified and it gets converted into a hard bridging structure hard bridging granulation tissue and later on this gets converted into a normal bone and which gets remodeled this is similar picture where you have lot of angiogenesis new bone formation there so now these are inflammatory mediators which are present in the fracture hematoma or in the fracture exudate and these <coughs> hematoma these chemical mediators are important and responsible for process of healing process of healing is what you are inducing the cells you are stimulating these mesenchymal cells to form a osteoblast and these osteoblast as we have seen is responsible for process of healing and it is a key cell for healing of a fracture or forming a new tissue there now this fracture ex exudate or a fracture hematoma this is very important because it has lot of potential it has lot of chemical mediators and these mediators what they do these mediators they stimulate the mesenchymal cells mesenchymal cells may be from endosteum may be from periosteum may be from the surrounding muscle or a soft tissue even these cells they have a potential to get converted into osteoblast once the osteoblast are formed that they will start working like they will secrete osteum leucin or they will secrete alkaline phosphatase and process of healing will proceed they will either form a one bone or if these chemical mediators or if there is a instability or vascular supply at the fracture site is less then these chemical mediators will convert these mesenchymal cells into cartilage cells and you will have a longer process of healing like by endochondral ossification but if you have a by o1 bone like direct osteoblast are forming a bone like o1 bone then it is a relatively faster way of secret forming a bone like <coughs> we have already seen this collagen like osteoblast be osteoblast they secret collagen and osseum you see which are embedded and these osteoblast cells they are surrounded by these osseum you see this tissue also secrete alkaline phosphatase and this alkaline phosphatase secreted by osteoblast is responsible for calcification of this osseum you see once this osseum you see is calcified this osteoblast cells is trapped between the ossified material or ossified tissue and this osteoblast is converted into a osteocyte and now a blood vessel will grow inside it and a new lamellar bone will be synthesized around this uh, osteocyte the whole aversion system will form this is how bone in gets converted into a o one bone gets converted into a bone now callus we always call callus callus is not there callus is there if you understand callus is a greek word means hard but it is a soft granulation tissue in to start with when callus is growing from one end to another and it's a soft and when they bridge together when they unite from one cal one side to another side and later on it gets converted or it gets ossified it gets mineralized to form a hard callus now based on the anatomical position of callus you can classify that as external callus or internal callus or a cortical callus when it, whether it's bridging bone to bone or whether it's bridging below the periosteum on the outer side or whether it's a in the endosteal side now in o1 bone you directly your osteoblast cells get convert helps you in get converting the normal bone but when 
there is an abnormal mobility or some mobility is there at the or when bones are not immobilized completely like we have seen in the, <coughs> like in functional cast brace when there is some motion at the fracture site then the mesenchymal cells they get converted into cartilage cells this process of formation of a bone is little lengthy it takes some more time as compared to what we seen in the one bone <coughs> formation this mesenchymal cells behave like a chondroblast these chondroblast again they lay down some material and uh, collagen cells in surrounding area and this gets mineralized and this once they get mineralized this chondrocyte or a chondroblast is trapped between the tissues uh, this mineralized tissue and the for nutrition to this chondro blast cells is affected and ultimately this chondroblast dies once chondroblast dies the osteoclastic cells they decode the chondro uh, center of the chondroblast cells and they lay down a new blood vessel and osteoblast cells form there and they lay down a full aversion system in sir in the core of a chondroblast this is how bone forms in the endochondral ossification way now the lamellar <coughs> the dead calcified as we have seen disintegrates and invaded by blood vessel and osteoblasts and lamellar bone forms and third way is inter intercortical osteonol migration where bone jumps or tunneling occurs from one cortex to another like we have seen in primary healing when we are trying to compress once upon a time we used to think that that is the only way bone will heal like a primary healing and we'll try and we used to use lot of compression devices to compress 1 mm or maybe less gap should be there so this is the when we compress the fracture site and make them one unit the there is a intracortical osteonol migration here the osteoclast cells they make a tunnel like we make tunnel in for the uh, <coughs> tunnel from one cortex to another cortex and in the core of a tunnel osteoblast cells and new blood vessel grow like you see tunnel is being formed when bone grows from one side to another and this is a job of osteoclast we have seen in the basic thing osteoclast they secrete acid phosphatase and this acid phosphatase is responsible for lysis and this helps you in getting making a tunnel so once osteoclast cells are active so osteoclastic activity is very important when we want our bone to heal by primary intention now primary intention bone will heal only by tunneling from one cortex to another cortex and cutting cone will help this plastic activity once tunnel is ready and based on your chemical mediator impulse osteoblast and blood vessels will grow from one cortex to another cortex and bone will have a good union now this remodeling is also very important that depends on the that depends on the potential on the uh, stress stresses on the fracture site or uh, complete healed callus or you can say a complete healed material what is there based on the stress lines you have deposition of osteoblast or osteoclast like we have seen lot of angular deformities along the axis gets corrected that is because the stress lines work on the basis of old law like <laughs> if there is on concavity and on the convex side you have a uh, osteoblastic activity or osteoclastic activity which will help you in correcting the various deformities <coughs> we see a concept of compression and distraction that is axial micromotion now up till now we used to see that the mobility at the fracture site is very important and only compression is ne necessary for a healing of a fracture but we during the course of research we have realized and understood that even distraction in a judicious way is important and helpful for healing of a process or inducing a process of uh, healing now distraction how much it is to be given and where it has to be given it needs to be studied like we have seen during eliza rao's uh, research or eliza rao's work distraction osteogenesis that we are going to see again that distraction occurring at the fracture site will induce the process of healing there and you will have a more chemical mediators there now this axial micro motion basically when uh, 
if, like we have seen in uh, functional cast bracing when you are allowing patient to bed bear so that maintains the vascularity in the extremity and at the fracture site and that will help you in a faster or better healing similarly when you allow patient to wait bear on the stable fracture then definitely that also improves the fracture of healing by inducing the frac uh, mediators at the fracture site how much motion and how much which stage of healing these are all debatable topic and needs to be discussed in the future now when you put a plaster like avoni or biloni plaster and don't allow patient to wait bear or do any exercise that may lead to a fracture disease leading to wasting of muscle stiffness of joint edema and decrease circulation and that will again hamper the process of healing that is this is not a physiological way to treat the fracture so best way is to allow patient to do some activity like mobilize the joints above and below the immobilized joints that will help you in maintaining the blood circulation in the fracture site now cancellous bone usually healed by a primary intention where lot of surface area is there like in chanley study they have we, we used to use a compression clamp for a new fusion where tibial and femoral condyle they were compressed primarily and they showed a very good healing by a primary intention where intracortical osteonal migration principle will happen and in the gap if gap is there that gap will lead, heal by formation of o1 bone so relatively this cancellous bone healing is faster as compared to cortical bone because large surface area good vascularity and good immobilization is possible now this same principle is being used for intra articular or metaphyseal fracture fixation where we 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 need to fix this fracture by interfragmentary or a lax screw that will help you in get, you getting a primary intention primary healing and that will give you good result if you fix this fractures pri properly then you can maintain the function of a joint by starting early mobilization here conservative uh, modality like functional cast brace or other plaster me mechanism modalities may not help you and they will lead to a more stiffness and <coughs> improper function of a joint like we have already seen functional cast brace here most important is for a fracture refracture of a callus every day till fracture unites like fra when your patient is standing and walking with the functional cast brace like a tibial start fracture the compression is occurring at fracture site when patient is walking and when he is of monopedal stance when he is offloading the extremity the distraction is occurring at the fracture site that may lead to a fracture and refracture of a callus which is forming there and it again forms a chemical mediator so most of the time when you have seen these patients will complain of a raised local temperature at the site of a fracture because there are a lot of chemical mediators being released repeatedly because of fracture and refracture and bone will heal very faster like we have seen early weight bearing in tibial fracture where second day or first day once patient is stable you start weight full weight bearing with the help of crutches and support so this will induce the process of healing faster as compared to but this is possible only if your fracture anatomy permits you to allow weight bearing you cannot start full weight bearing on day one in a severely comminuted or a segmental fracture if transverse fracture or short oblique fracture and which is stable in your plaster cast or a functional cast brace then only you can start a early weight bearing already we have seen in compression plating you are aiming for a primary union where you are trying to compress the two ends by use of a metal but what happens once this take lot of time because intracortical osteonal migration bone will grow from one side to another side there is no callus formation because we have devitalized the bone for putting a plate we have removed the periosteum there is no fracture hematoma we have drained out the fracture hematoma so primarily or solely we are dependent on a primary healing so most of the time what happens if bone does not heal then there is a chance of refracture of a implant or a plate can fracture or secondly <coughs> there may be a stress riser because there is a difference in a uh, uh, difference difference in the bone and the metal so at the junction you can have a osteopenia or osteoporosis leading to fracture at the end of a plate this is a known complication and which we need to understand and keep in mind so usually after 18 months 
to two years we plan and remove the implant. In case of intramedullary nailing, if you using a intramedullary nail again, axial micro motion may occur at the fracture site, or you have used a dynamic hole for locking your bolt, then definitely this dynamization can give you induce the axial micro motion at the fracture site and will help you in getting a faster and better healing. <coughs> Now in external fixator, again, you are not disturbing the hematoma, you are aiming for a secondary type of healing. Axial micro motion again is permissible or possible. <laughs> Axial micro motion is very important part of a healing in a lower limb or weight bearing bones. And this is important for inducing the fracture of healing. We have seen what this motion does. They will induce the cells, which cells, pre-mesenchymal cells, and they will, in, in, what they will do, they will in, inflammatory mediators these mediators will induce these cells ultimately and will enhance or fasten the process of healing. Now, biocompression bone, as you know, is an elastic tissue and loading it, it bends or deforms and unloading it corrects itself. So, biocompression is a term used for stresses and strain created under physiological load in a healthy bone. Bone derived of a stress undergoes local or general atrophy and stress shielding can occur like we have seen in a compression uh, compression plating where under the surface of a plate can uh, be osteopenic and can lead to a fracture. In contrast, physical activity will increase the bone mass, will increase the vascularity and will help you in getting the better callus formation. Now, how we can stimulate the healing? We can stimulate healing by bioelectrical phenomenon, by motion at the fracture site or axial micro motion by osteoinduction stimulus by bone raft or other material and bone morphogenic protein implants. So there are proliferative elements in periosteum, endosteum and bone marrow we have seen and some micro environmental conditions, bioelectrical potentials, oxygen tension and micro motions will help you in inducing the process of healing and they will provide and stimulate the <coughs> healing. Bioelectrical phenomenon, stresses generated in the bone by relative motion, like when patient is trying and weight bearing, the electric current is generated at the fracture ends and this will also again help you in getting the healing after fracture site by liberating chemical mediators and by stimulating the mesenchymal cells to get converted into an osteoblast. Now, like we, this is the most important topic, abnormalities of fracture healing. What happens if fracture does not heal as per our expectation? We want our fracture to heal, but definitely there are some factors which may lead to failure of fracture healing. And failure means repair of repair or a fibrous union when bone, like we have seen in the beginning, fracture healing is an inflammatory process. And end of inflammation, maybe it's a regeneration, normal bone forms, or a repair, you get a fibrous tissue. And this fibrous tissue or, or fibrous non-union <coughs> is responsible or it's a sequelae of a inflammatory mediators like we are seeing in the COVID, a lot of inflammation is there and this COVID inflammation in the lungs is responsible for fibrosis in the lung. So fibrosis is a sequelae of inflammation. So we give them anti-inflammatory medications and we try and cut down on the response to the inflammation. Non-union is another most important complication and delayed union or a pseudo arthrosis when there is a lot of mobility at the non union side, a pseudo joint can form and which can lead to a joint formation there. Now, non union complete break, like some reasons, like interposition of a soft tissue. If soft tissue is interposed in between two fracture fragments, there is no contact or communication, then definitely this fracture will never heal whatever you do. Three months, six months, whatever criteria you can use. But this fracture will never heal unless you intervene, you remove the soft tissue and treat the fracture accordingly. Similarly, vascularity is affected because of compounding of a fracture or extensive dissection or soft tissue injury. Or some fractures are prone for non-union like fracture neck femur or scaphoid, where fracture hematoma is continuously diluted with the help of cyanoval fluid or cambium layer of a periosteum is absent there or those so. Secondary union is difficult. We are to depend on other cells to convert into osteoblast cells. Now, <coughs> nine months is the time frame given for definition of a non-union. 
now every fracture has its own time table like 3 months 6 months 9 months based on the anatomical location based on the type of a fracture whether it's a, a segmental fracture or whether it's a wedge um, fracture or bone loss is there based on that you can have a atrophic or a hypertrophic type of non union like we have seen these mesenchymal cells of a granulation tissue or pluripotential cell cells they get converted into fibroblast why because environment there is not good because they cannot convert themselves into osteoblast so because poor vascularity and immobilization is not there so these fractures are moving together and this abnormal mobility at the fracture site and loss of vascularity is responsible for getting converted into either cartilage or into fibroblast cells and based on that that will take the path so what is most important for when you plan any fracture treatment is vascularity and immobilization now delayed union again similar reasons are there like excessive stripping of a tissue revitalizing the vascularity or fracture anatomy like lot of comminuted fracture is there then definitely it's going to take lot of time for a healing so we need to understand and we need to explain to the patient that this particular fracture is a comminuted and compound so it may go for a delayed union or it may go into the non union we try and take all precautions like we put them in the brace or we allow them weight bearing and we start the use other <coughs> modalities for getting better result now how do we diagnose fracture whether it's a healing or not healing you definitely radiology x ray is our very good friend without x ray orthopedic surgeons cannot work now with the help of ct scan we can have a three dimensional visualization of a fracture healing callus once callus is calcified that very well be seen on a ct scan and you can evaluate like elizara has come with the concept of distraction osteogenesis in the process initiated by application of those tension wires and rings and we did a corticotomy osteotomy and did a distraction so basically what we have to understand that when the regenerate forms it is by intramembranous ossification like there is no cartilage cells there so usually you get the faster regenerate there so in direct osteoblast cells they are formed and they get laid down into a new bone there they secrete osteomucin and again alkaline phosphatase and mineralization and the whole process is a short as compared to uh, endochondral ossification but we have to understand that if there is a abnormal mobility or if your fracture frame or external fixator frame is giving instability then you will have a cartilage cells formation there then you will have a slow process of regeneration there so this is how it's very important for us to understand the distraction osteogenesis so mechanical factors like stability at fracture site like we know it's a elastic frame when patient start weight bearing early weight bearing definitely patient have a faster and better healing or the vascularity of the whole limb is maintained so biology of the fracture site is maintained we are giving stability so chemical mediators they are synthesized there and they will help you in getting a faster regeneration similarly when you distract the corticotomy or osteotomy site the whole limb vascularity increases and that is also responsible for a faster and better healing now <coughs> now eu people they have modified the whole thing and they have come up with uniplanar fixators and the same fixators are used for using a limb lengthening and other thing here some people they have used a distracted a callus like after 10 days you start distraction so usually that is called as a callostasis the epiphyseal injuries leading to malfunctioning or angular deformities that can very well be corrected with the help of a callostasis or distracting callus and the one particular plane now fracture in the children as we know periosteum is very thick and healing potential is very high so these patients will usually heal faster and secondly if there are a lot of deformities like shortening of around 1 cm 1.5 cm in the femur or angular deformities around 10 degrees they can very well be corrected during the phase of remodeling like because of old flaw as we have seen there is a lot of osteoblastic and plastic activity depending on the deformity convex side or a con concave side rate of union again depends on various factors what we have seen vascularity what we have seen handling of the tissue what we have seen age of the patient these will all decide the rate of a union now 
local factors which are important for a healing of a fracture like individual bone susceptibility like we've seen cancerous bone behaves differently cortical bone behaves differently the blood supply is different in different part of bone like lower third of tibia there is no not much a soft tissue so bone quality is good but vascularity is poor so definitely we have to be solely dependent on the bone vascularity there is no soft tissue surrounding it so healing process will be definitely slower as compared to upper third tibia which has lot of tissue around it so vascularity will be better similarly fracture neck of the femur as we have seen the cambium layer is absent biomechanically it's a unstable fracture or secondly <laughs> Uh, the the mechanical forces acting like if fracture line is vertical the shearing forces may be more at the fracture site that will again help you that will not allow your bridging callus or a bridging bone to heal completely that will keep on putting lot of stress and strain at the healing callus or bridging bone similar in the scaphoid fracture you have issues related to vascularity now soft tissue is very important handling of the soft tissue is very important because that maintains the vascularity the envelope soft tissue is very important for a healing process maintaining periosteum and endosteum is also again important Make local other factors like interposition of soft tissue or handling of the soft tissue is important and mobility required mobility should be there so elastic mobility you can say or axial micro motion should be there which will help you in getting a secondary type of healing or a fast healing Yeah, and again, you have to keep your patient active and mobile so that the vascularity of the limb is maintained. Similarly, infection is again again a detrimental for a process of fracture healing, and it will behave differently in case of infection at the fracture site. Like uh, other biological factors, like age, children will have a faster healing as compared to old age. Old people will have a slow process of healing. Functional activity we have seen. poor nutritional and deficiencies like uh, protein deficiency can lead to protein deficiency can lead to <coughs> loss of um, osteoid mucin formation like we have seen osteoblasts what they do they secrete osteomucin they secrete lot of uh, alkaline phosphatase so if there is a protein deficiency or albumin deficiency then definitely the quality of osteo collagen tissue synthesized by osteoblast will be poor like we have seen in scurvy the collagen tissue deficiency is there so that will lead to a different type of healing or if mineralization is not there properly like we see in the rickets then you have a unmineralized osteoid there osteoblast cells are there synthesizing they are secreting osteoid but that osteoid is not getting converted into a matured bone because there is deficiency of vitamin d and calcium and phosphorus are deficient and leading to unmineralized osteoid bone contamination again will lead to infection and infection can be a disaster at the fracture site like associated tumors or bone loss can also be a detrimental for a normal healing process smoking is again very difficult uh, to explain to people that process of healing is very slow in smokers because vascularity is a issue in the issue irradiated bone or patient on steroid again will have a lot of loss of mediator because the steroid they act as anti inflammatory medication so the mediators of inflammation required for a normal healing will be affected and they will be detrimental for a normal healing now diet and other things are very important these patients should give adequate proteins and other minerals so that they have a better healing diabetes is another important thing which we have to keep in mind and these patients will behave differently than non diabetics and delayed uh, ossification delayed process of healing is observed in this particular group of patient cigarette smoking or nicotine we have already seen they have a high risk of non union or pseudo arthrosis as compared to normal they are slow healers you can say hiv again they are on various antiviral drugs and medications and pnf alpha deficiencies will again disturb with the mediators of inflammation required for a healing various medication like we have seen patients with osteoporosis they are on bisphosphonates for long time and these patients they they will definitely will have a pseudo they will have a they we have observed some fractures like in subtrochanteric region on long term patients on bisphosphonates can lead to a, a typical fracture in femoral shaft 
steroids already we know nacid again it's a controversial thing most of them they have a cop inhibitors and these enzymes are affected because of the these medication and they will also slow down the process of healing like these mediators what are cox2 inhibitors they are inhibiting and these are important for healing so in these patients usually what is recommended is you should use drugs which are not having a potent anti inflammatory we want to give only analgesics so pilin paracetamol or tramadol like medications or other group of medication which will not affect the inflammatory mediators should also be considered in this group of patients when patient has a fracture rather than giving them baclofenac sodium for 10 days 11 days and which will definitely affect our process of healing which we are aiming at we are we are ourselves disturbing the process of healing by putting them on anti inflammatory medication now this is the most important thing osteoinductive stimulus bone graft autogenous cancellous bone graft has a lot of potential and this has been used to induce the process of healing like we 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 induce process of healing in case of non union or primary bone grafting can be done so what they do usually when you lay down a cancellous bone there they have lot of enzymes bone morphogenic proteins inside inbuilt and these bone morphogenic proteins and chemical mediators in the bone graft they stimulate these mesenchymal cells in the vicinity of fracture area and these mesenchymal cells get converted into osteoblast and they will enhance the process of healing the bone morphogenic protein is like a perfume you have a flower you have a perfume bone graft is like a flower and bone morphogenic protein is like a perfume extract of that particular flower so bone morphogenic protein can directly be used and this is a very important development of or of the research and this will definitely has helped us in uh, understanding of a fracture healing healing process so bone morphogenic protein can directly induce these cells mesenchymal cells if you put this bone morphogenic proteins at the fracture site or at the non union site then you can very well have the same atmosphere of a um, bone graft and you can have a direct healing process and you don't have a morbidity of a donor site bone morphogenic protein lot of work has been done and this has been extensively used by spine surgeons for using in the mediatronics they mediatronic they generate lot of revenues from the bone morphogenic proteins and this being used for spinal fusion cases now there are a lot of literature is available on bone morphogenic proteins and they are available in india also even bone morphogenic protein is available in injectable form which can very well be used in the capsule or a granular form at the fracture site and definitely they will act as good as bone graft only thing is the cost so now as we produce international in india cost definitely will go down and this will make our life very easy now uh, this bone morphogenic protein can very well be used for avascular necrosis also if you understand the whole process of healing the same bone is dead now dead bone is replaced with the help of creeping substitution now when avascular necrosis the dead femoral head is replaced how it's replaced again the same osteoclastic activity has to go there the core of the bone has to come out the new osteoblast cells has to go there a blood vessel has to go there and new bone has to form the whole process the skeleton of a bone is being used as a osteoconductive material or same material is laid down with the new life has been given with the help of new osteoblast in a blood vessel now this ria is a uh, <coughs> bone graft harvesting procedure by intramedullary bone grafting we can remove by intra intramedullary marrow aspiration this is the instrument by which we can remove lot of bone grafts and these has lot of induction potential so these bone grafts can very well be used when you are opening a fracture for a fixation or even if you are not opening you are making a entry you just remove the bone graft from the greater trochanter by first remove the bone graft then put the nail and then inject the bone graft at the fracture site or you can make a solution and you can inject so this will definitely enhance or induce the process of healing same thing can be done in radius ulna when you are doing radius ulna fracture you can squeeze out or remove the bone marrow from the medullary cavity and same can be used as a bone graft freeze or dread bone graft these are again same mechanism is being used where creeping substitution whole bone is being replaced but skeleton is maintained the dacha is maintained only 
or uh, plastic activity and blastic activity happens and this gets incorporated into the human body like these are again some induction bone induction material or mechanism by using low intensity ultrasound at the fracture site again you are inducing the process of inflammation there and this will definitely help you in getting better and faster healing electromagnetic and electrical stimulation can very well be uh, <coughs> studied and it has been used for inducing a process of healing in various types now extra carporeal shock wave lithotripsy this again the same mechanism it will induce the inflammation there by hammering at the fracture site the callus is there it will re break and the inflammation will restart so basically it is a inflammatory process start and restart so your healing will be faster if you use these particular things now management of segmental bone defect this is just two slides now vasculite modification technique can very well be used for defect in the bone like you see there is a bone loss here bone defect you put in a nail inside use a spacer of a cement you cut and devolve it and put it again tie with something so you can remove it later on once the membrane forms once after 6 to 8 weeks membrane forms you remove you pack the whole cavity with the help of bone broth here again you are using a, a chunk of cancellous bone powder or putty which can which is getting incorporated with the primary bone above and below because this will work because membrane is there so vascularity is there this will work because there is a stability the primary stability with the help of external fixator or with the help of intramedullary nail is mandatory for this type of technique so healing will occur by secondary intention here the whole bone graft will get incorporated like you see here this, this is a diagram from the book we don't have much experience but i thought of sharing this particular with you so you understand fracture healing is not only in the bone but this can very well be utilized in the big defect where you have used primarily a bone cement block to get the membrane and later on it's replaced with the help of a particular cancel as bone graft this can very well be used from the rea and this bone graft will get incorporated from above and below because stability is there and vascularity is maintain your patient if it has a bone defect soft tissue defect then sometimes may have to cover with the help of local flap so the vascularity is maintained so six tips to help heal broken bone stop smoking eat diet watch your calcium adhere to treatment plan listen to your doctor augment various modalities can be used thank you very much for your patience listening